Okay, um, thank you for watching this uh, recording. This is joint work with my friends Juan at LBS and Ivan at Warwick Business School. In this paper, we are concerned with now casting GDP and now casting economic activity more broadly. We develop a dynamic factor model that we estimate with Bayesian methods. Dynamic factor models have been widely uh, applied for the purpose of now casting economic activity. So what is novel here is that we incorporate additional components uh, into the model uh, in order to explicitly capture features of the data that are very salient. In particular, we explicitly model low frequency variation in the mean and the volatility of the time series. We allow individual series to load on the common factor with a lag, which essentially gives richer dynamics. And we incorporate the possibility of fat tailed observations. We then put the model and the novel components to the test out of sample. And we do so in a very ambitious um, formal evaluation exercise on fully real-time, unrevised vintage data from the US over a period of 20 years. This uh, involves re-estimating the model thousands of times, and uh, we basically uh, make this feasible using uh, a very efficient algorithm and by relying on uh, cloud computing. We then also, so the evaluation period uh, ends in, in the end of 2019. We then also uh, evaluate the model during the COVID-19 recession. This is still a work in progress, but I, I do hope I have some, some time to show you some interesting results on that today as well. To motivate uh, our methodology and how we include these novel, novel components, I just want to flash a couple of uh, pictures at you. The first one uh, should be um, very familiar to most of you. This is real GDP growth. And I'm superimposing here on the time series um, a mean for different uh, you know, regimes, for different familiar episodes of the post-war period, and the standard deviation. And what we see is that there are basically uh, changes at lower frequency, both in what is the mean uh, growth rate of GDP and what is the the volatility um, of GDP, and we'll formally incorporate that into our model. The second uh, set of pictures, I'm showing you in each of these panels in red, a common activity factor, and in blue, uh, individual uh, time series of indicators of economic activity. Uh, what you can see here that an indicator such as industrial production is pretty coincident with the common uh, movement of the cycle, while um, housing series lead the cycle um, a little bit and labor market series, for example, lag uh, the cycle a little bit. And this is something that will be explicitly uh, modeled in our framework. And the third uh, piece of motivation is on outliers, which will be captured by a T distributed component. I'm plotting here the month-on-month uh, -month changes in two um, uh, macroeconomic indicators that will enter the dynamic factor model. Um, and what you see here is that these uh, series um, every now and then have outliers. And they have uh, uh, very characteristic outliers in the sense that these typically happen in the level, which means that the growth rate of the series kind of bounces up and down. Um, so series may have outliers in the growth rate, but it's quite common that there are these uh, characteristic level outliers. And we will allow for that explicitly in the model, while uh, practitioners would, uh, uh, would oftentimes just um, manually remove such outliers. Okay, so these were the three kind of pieces of motivation for how we set up our uh, dynamic factor model machinery. This is the plan for the rest of the presentation. I'll show you the model in detail. I'll show it formally, and I will do that by iterating between equations and some charts in which I show how these uh, model 
components that we introduce actually work in sample, what, what they deliver in sample. After I, I introduce the model and, and kind of the um, anatomy of these components, I'll explain you our data and estimation algorithm. I'll show you how we set up our real-time evaluation exercise and then present the results. And then, as I mentioned, hopefully, I'll show you what, what we are currently working on in terms of uh, applying the model to the 2020 COVID recession. Okay, so to introduce the model, let's start from a very familiar um, dynamic factor model that is um, used in the literature to now cast economic activity. We have a vector of observables um, that can be both quarterly and monthly. Uh, these, vector, these observables typically enter the model in first differences, and they are then described as um, uh, being driven by uh, a set of common factors, or in the case of activity, we'll be using one factor, so a, a common factor, and an idiosyncratic component. And then both the common factor as well as the idiosyncratic component follow an autoregressive uh, process. What is important here is that in the standard model, uh, in, in the very basic um, version, these series have a constant mean in growth rates, or they will be demeaned before entering the model. And the factor and the idiosyncratic co components have constant volatilities. So the first thing that we introduce is that we allow the mean growth rate of some series to follow a time varying uh, par parameter, a time varying process. And this can, the way we set up the model is that we allow this for a subset of the series. So some series can have a constant mean, others have a time varying mean. And we also allow um, the common mean to be shared uh, between a, a subset of variables. For example, it can be shared between uh, output and consumption. So this is the first thing we do. And actually this, this part builds on an earlier paper that, uh, that we have, um, where we basically, um, where we focus on describing what this time varying mean uh, delivers in sample. And let me show you one picture. So basically here I am showing you the growth rate um, of real GDP and I'm superimposing the time varying intercept of the GDP equation, which gives you something that can be interpreted as the permanent component or the basically the long run uh, growth rate of GDP. And this lines up very well with uh, familiar episodes of the U.S. post-war period, for example, with the um, slowdown of the 1970s or the, you know, the, the boom of the 1990s. And we also show in our previous paper that according to this methodology, uh, U.S. GDP growth has, has started slowing down prior um, to the Great Recession. We also introduce um, stochastic volatility. So we allow both the volatility of the factor and the volatility of the idiosyncratic component to be varying over time. And both the, um, um, both the intercept as well as the volatilities are following uh, random walk processes. This is also something we have done in the previous paper. And here I'm just showing you the, uh, the in-sample posterior estimate of the factor volatility which also conveys um, you know, familiar episodes such as the great moderation or the fact that uh, you know, volatility increases in, in recessions. What else do we do? So as I've mentioned in the motivation, a uh, series that enters such a dynamic factor model for the purposes of now casting uh, exhibits some phase shift. So what we do is that in the observation equation, we allow individual series to load on the common factor with some uh, lag polynomial. Um, what this delivers in sample, quite interestingly, is that uh, it allows series with a different dynamic profile to, um, to still be informative uh, about the factor. So 
What I mean by this is that you can see in this picture that in the black, um, in this black circled line, I plot the factor and how it responds to an, to an innovation. Uh, the factor is autoregressive of order two, so it gives you this hump-shaped response. If you have a single factor model uh, without this lag structure, then you are essentially hardwiring into the model that all the series um, behave proportional to the common factor. This is what you see, for example, in our model with surveys uh, in the right panel. But with this uh, richer lead lag structure, uh, you see that uh, essentially the loadings on the coincident factor and the lags uh, can take different values. And then we see that some of the series, and in particular GDP itself, um, have this kind of monotonic impulse response function to a factor in innovation. Where, whereas others have um, have a reversing um, a, a reversing dynamic profile, so this basically allows series that are not fully coincident with the factor to be more informative uh, about the factor. Finally, um, I mentioned the outliers, in particular the outliers that you see in levels, and we also capture this explicitly in the model by having a T distributed component that can that also enters the measurement equation and it can enter the measurement equation in the level of the variable. This is T distributed and we estimate the degrees of freedom of the T distributed component of an individual series together with the other um, parameters of the model. What does this achieve? So, one a thing that is interesting in, in now casting models uh, that you can do is you can compute the so-called news decomposition. So what you can do is you look at the forecast error in an individual series that enters the model and then check how the estimate of the factor would be updated based on this forecast error. This is shown here in the blue line for a standard dynamic factor model in which this is a linear relationship. So this is the case for industrial production. Say you have a positive forecast error on industrial production, you basically have good news. Uh, and this means you're updating the factor uh, in a positive way. The same is true in our model. However, the T distributed component makes this function, what, what we call the influence function, makes it non-linear and non-monotonic. Essentially, if there are good news about uh, industrial production that are small good news, you would update them more um, than when they are very large because the model in quote understands that they would then be uh, treated more of an outlier. Okay, so you get this kind of interesting uh, non-monotonic news decomposition with the T distributed component. So let me just summarize again. I've, I've shown you the, the model and how we formally incorporate this, um, these three new components and what they achieve in sample. So we have low frequency variation in the mean and variance, which are captured by time varying parameters, time varying intercepts and volatilities. We have this lead lag dynamics, which we capture with a more flexible a polynomial, loadings polynomial in the measurement equation. And we have recurring um, outliers, which we capture with this T distributed component. We now, I'm now gonna explain how we estimate the model and how we select the data. And then I go to the out of sample evaluation. We use data for the United States. We use both quarterly uh, time series as well as a number of monthly uh, indicators, uh, both hard uh, and soft indicators. And in terms of choosing, in terms of composing this panel of series, we basically follow um, what I would call um, best practice uh, in the literature. So we select them, we select, you know, series that are relatively timely, such as surveys um, and then other series that capture you know lab the labor market uh, production uh, and so on um, and in the end we um, we end up with 
a panel of 28 indicators, which is what I'm just uh, showing you here very briefly. There are a couple of quarterly ones um, and then uh, mostly monthly indicators. Um, and some of them are surveys, some of them are hard uh, indicators. We estimate uh, the model with Bayesian methods. I don't want to go into too much detail, but we're essentially shrinking the model uh, with tight priors towards uh, its version in which these components that we're introducing don't play a role. So we're shrinking it to, towards a very simple factor model to basically let uh, the data speak about the degree to which these new um, components are, are um, supported by the dynamics in the data. We have done um, a lot of work on improving the um, efficiency of the algorithm. Um, let me just uh, highlight two points. So basically, in, in our Gibbs sampling algorithm, there are some steps which are essentially multivariate steps, and some steps are univariate steps. For example, the uh, estimation of the individual uh, measurement equations of the observables. Um, and if you um, piece those steps, um, uh, you know, if you, if you piece them away, you can basically use parallelization uh, on, the, on the univariate steps. And this, this way you can um, gain, um, gain a lot of uh, efficiency uh, by, using, by using cloud computing techniques. We also implement a, a vectorized version of the Kalman filter. Um, and yeah, the bottom line is that we have kind of greatly improved the, the speed of the algorithm. Okay, for the out of sample uh, exercise, what do we do? We construct real, as we say, real real time data. So we construct actual uh, vintage data from this um, Alfred database. Um, uh, so what we're doing is basically we're putting ourselves in the position of a forecaster that at a given point in time really uses the information that was uh, available at that point in time. This involves uh, some interesting intricacies. For example, survey data, you can go back in a point in time and, and get uh, survey data that was available at that point, but the seasonal adjustment uh, when you download this data actually hasn't been in done in real time. So we retrieve the unseasonally adjusted series and then deseasonalize it with the information that we have in real time. So the bottom line is here that we are basically very, very careful in, in constructing this really real time unrevised uh, vintage database. And then, you know, with a panel of data of the sort that I've shown you with these um, 28 indicators, you get a new piece of information basically uh, on average every second day. And we're re-estimating the model um, every single time when this happens. Our uh, out of sample period starts in 2000. So our time series start in the 60s, the earliest ones. Uh, and then our out of sample window starts in 2000. And then in, every time new information comes in, we re-estimate re the model. So this means uh, you, you have you know, thousands of vintages. And if you just run this on, an, on a standard computer, it would take you months. And we have kind of, as I mentioned, we have parallelized, um, we have made this very parallelizable and we're running it uh, in the cloud, which greatly um, improves the speed and which basically makes this uh, feasible. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, evaluation results for this um, formal out of sample exercise. And I'm going to be comparing our model, which has all the new features, with a basic dynamic factor model that has constant means, constant volatilities, just a coincident loading on the factor and no outliers. Uh, towards the end, I will also show you some evidence on how these individual components um, uh, contribute to the improvement that we get. So here is... Um, a picture that shows you the actual realization of US GDP growth in this black line, and then the um, forecast 
or the now cast um, of GDP for two different models just before the release. So the, the blue one um, is a basic dynamic factor model and the red one is our full dynamic factor model with these additional components. And then you have the associated um, credible bands. What we see here is that, um, and this is a point we made in our previous paper, is that essentially uh, the period after the Great Recession is characterized by the basic dynamic factor model being upward biased. So in that period after the Great Recession, you consistently overestimate real GDP growth with a constant dynamic factor model. Our model is kind of well centered around the realization. And this mainly comes from the trend that we introduce. So in, after the Great Recession, uh, in fact, uh, already somewhat before, you have this slowdown on average. If you don't capture this and if you have a constant mean, you're um, hardwiring into the model that it bounces back to the basically the post-war mean, which is higher. So, you know, this novel component really helps uh, at, at now casting GDP in, a, in an environment where you have low frequency change. You also see in this picture that our model is much better at capturing turning points. So, for example, around the Great Recession, uh, it's, it's much faster at, at uh, rebounding than, um, well, it's in this picture still pretty close together, but if you zoom in, it's, it's a lot, it's meaningfully faster uh, at capturing the rebound from the recession. In terms of formal evaluation, we evaluate both point and density uh, forecasts. What I'm showing you here is the average root mean squared error um, over different forecasting horizons for the two models. So, um, we start um, 180 days before the release and then we move forward and we check each time what is the what is the root mean squared error both models reduce the root mean squared error as additional information comes in so the forecast gets unsurprisingly uh, more accurate but our model is much better at improving this uh, forecast at, at all our horizons, essentially. And the significance here um, formally is not plotted, but it's, it's significant, essentially, um, across, uh, across horizons. Um, the same is true for density forecasting. So here we plot the log score, which um, more accurate means a higher log score. Again, both models improve over the horizon as you get closer to the release um, of, of GDP, but across horizons, the model beats um, a standard dynamic factor model. What is also important is that I've shown you the performance over a horizon. Here, I'm showing you the performance in real time through time. So as we expand the out of sample window, uh, and I'm computing a rolling root mean squared or error. So this basically tells us, would you have selected our model over a basic dynamic factor model uh, uh, kind of early in the, in the sample? And the answer is yes, after you know one or two years, you're essentially beating, uh, beating the standard model. And, and well before the Great Recession, the same is true uh, in terms of density forecasting. Here, this table summarizes how the different components that we add um, improve the forecasting performance in relative terms. So what we're showing is the root mean squared error for a basic AR1 model. And then we're moving to a standard dynamic factor model. We're adding the low frequency variation in means and volatilities. We're adding the heterogene heterogeneous uh, lead lag dynamics, and then we're adding the fat tailed the fat tails and we're adding these things successively on top and then do, we do a formal test against the in quotes previous model um, so what you see is um, that essentially you get a large improvement from adding the low frequency variation you get meaningful additional uh, improvement from the lead lag dynamics and you get somewhat um, of a small improvement from having the fat tails. The fat tails, however, have 
uh, some interesting uh, other features in terms of uh, op operating the model uh, in real time, as you will see in a moment. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the evaluation. So basically, we have added these components to the model motivated by seeing what are salient features of macro data. Um, and then uh, we have shown that in a you know expensive formal ev evaluation exercise, they very much improved the performance of the model out of sample. Let me say a few words of how this model performs during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first thing here is, um, I mean, you may know this from your own experience that many formal models actually don't work at all with the data releases that we have seen. So they go out of the window. Um, our model hasn't. And so we have been observing what these additional components basically have been doing during the, um, during the lockdown. And I'll, I'll show you something about this. And we have also been working on, just to give you um, a teaser, on how you can incorporate, uh, in quotes, alternative data into the DFM framework. Because a lot of um, economists and policymakers started you know, paying close attention to these new, very short uh, history series, such as restaurant uh, bookings on open table and so on. And we have been working a little bit on how you can piece that together with the DFM uh, machinery. So, um, stay tuned some results on that will hopefully soon uh, be in in the draft that we're going to upload so let me just so show you three slides on the model during the great lockdown the first thing i want to show you is here is basically um gdp and gdp growth and the common factor in black and red and then in march 2020 so when everything starts happening a fan chart for our nowcast. The black dotted line is the consensus uh, forecast, uh, but that's not really uh, crucial for the picture here. What I want to show you mainly is that our incorporation of stochastic volatility shows the, captures the massive increase in uncertainty that we see. So we, we do at that point uh, forecast a massive reduction in GDP, but uncertainty goes up, bands massively go up, and this is an an, an attractive feature of the model. Then it's quite interesting how our outlier component works in the model. So as I've shown you, you have these uh, recurring level outliers, which gives you this bounce down, bounce up um, dynamic in the growth rates, in the month on month growth rates of the series. This is in fact what happened with retail sales, for example, during the lockdown. You first had a massive reduction and then it recovered. So you see this bounce down, bounce up in the growth rate. Our model captures that and hence our uh, predictions for the retail sales recovery were very, very precise in fact. So this is pretty interesting in terms of what this T distributed component can do. And then finally, let me just show you basically the June uh, 2020 nowcast. Um, and here uh, in the left panel, I'm showing you a standard uh, constant parameters dynamic factor model and its, its forecast, um, which is very persistently low. And then our model, which, so this is in growth rate, so it bounces down and up, which means in, in levels, it's more, it indicates more of a V-shape. So what is important here to understand is that in the standard model, you're basically imposing the same dynamics across all indicators. They inherit the dynamics of the factor. Our model allows that there can be some series that are persistently slow, such as surveys, and then others can actually bounce back so these heterogeneous lead lag dynamics really allow us to predict a different recovery. Whether we are right or wrong um, still remains to be seen. And you know, soon we'll have the Q2 release. So um, it should be quite interesting to monitor this over the next, the next few weeks. So our model is kind of more optimistic uh, and these new components help in, in explaining this optimism. Okay, let me wrap up. So we have proposed 
new features in a Bayesian dynamic factor model to capture um, salient um, characteristics of the data. And these features massively improve the model's uh, performance at now casting in terms of point and density forecasts. And the model has been saying some quite interesting things about the current uh, recessions and we're actively, we're actively working on that. Thank you very much.